Hi, this is Shannon from No Shelf Control. Thanks for joining me on the channel again tonight. I am here with the fourth out of four matches uh, in the second round for the Tournament of Books. So we are wrapping up the second round with these two books. And let me tell you, this is one of the more difficult head-to-heads I've seen. So I think I struggled and it looks like the judge struggled as well. So we will see what she has to say. Let's talk about the judge first. So our judge's name is Katie Waldman. She uses she, her pronouns, and she is a staff writer at The New Yorker for which she writes about books, culture, and more. Previously, she was a staff writer at Slate and the host of Slate's Audio Book Club podcast. She won the National Book Critics Circle's Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing in 2019 and the American Society of Magazine Editors Award for Journalists Under 30 in 2018. So that is Katie Waldman. You will be interested to see what she has done with her judging today, but I will hold that for a little longer. Let's first talk about our two books. So the first one is The Rabbit Hutch and it will be going head to head against Night Crawling. So let's talk about The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. Uh, it was published August 2nd, 2022 by Knopf and it's 352 pages. And here's the synopsis. The automobile industry has abandoned Vaca Vale, Indiana, leaving the residents behind too. In a rundown apartment building on the edge of town, commonly known as The Rabbit Hutch, a number of people now reside quietly, looking for ways to live in a dying city. Apartment C2 is lonely and detached. C6 is aging and stuck. C8 harbors an extraordinary fear. But C4 is of particular interest. Here live four teenagers who have recently aged out of the state foster care system, three boys and one girl, Blandine. Hauntingly beautiful and unnervingly bright, Blandine is plagued by the structures, people, and places that not only failed her, but actively harmed her. Now all Blandine wants is an escape, a true bodily escape like the mystics described in the book she reads. Set across one week and culminating in a shocking act of violence, the rabbit hutch chronicles a town on the brink, desperate for rebirth. How far will its residents, especially Blandine, go to achieve it? Does one person's gain always come at another's expense? Tess Gunty's The Rabbit Hutch is a gorgeous and provocative tale of loneliness and community, entrapment and freedom. It announces a major new voice in American fiction, one bristling with intelligence and vulnerability. So you'll remember this is one of the books for the tournament that I have read. I did really enjoy this. I noticed something in the synopsis this time. So we're talking about all the different apartments. And the one that was most sort of explosive where the violence happens is C4. Is that a little joke on Tess Gunty's part or is that just by accident? So, you know, C4 being an explosive, I thought maybe there was a little something there. But I could be reading something into nothing. But nonetheless, this is a great book. Um, I think it's framed on South Bend, Indiana. That's what I had heard. Um, Tess Gunty is a Notre Dame grad like me, so I'm a little bit biased, but not that much. Um, if I didn't like the book, I would say so, and I definitely did like it. As I said, there were parts of it that were a little academic for me, a little bit too much work, um, but not a lot. Most of the book was very accessible and I really enjoyed the characters and watching everything unfold going back and forth between characters. So that's The Rabbit Hutch. Let's talk about night crawling now that I know what night crawling is. Those of you who haven't seen my previous video, I did the last video about night crawling, did the entire video without having any idea what night crawling was and had to look it up afterwards and was like, oh. So I uh, filmed a little oopsie at the, <laughs> the end of the last video and explained myself. But now I'm all up to speed and we can talk about night crawling. So with regard to night crawling, it was published June 7th, 2022 by Knopf. I don't know that I've mentioned this before, but it was an Oprah's book club uh, selection. So that's interesting. And it is 277 pages. So let's talk about the synopsis. Here's the synopsis of Night Crawling. Kiara and her brother Marcus are scraping by in an East Oakland apartment complex, optimistically called the Regal High. Both have dropped out of high school, their family fractured by death and prison. But while Marcus clings to his dream of rap stardom, Kiara hunts for work to pay their rent, 
which is more than doubled, and to keep the nine-year-old boy next door, abandoned by his mother, safe and fed. One night, what begins as a drunken misunderstanding with a stranger turns into the job Kiara never imagined wanting, but now desperately needs, night crawling. Her world breaks open even further when her name surfaces in an investigation that exposes her as a key witness in a massive scandal within the Oakland Police Department. So a very short synopsis. Um, I had mentioned last week when I talked about night crawling that the comparison between the two apartment buildings, the fact that um, we were looking at the apartment buildings that both characters live in between Rabbit Hutch and night crawling, even though they weren't going head to head last week was interesting to me. So now that they are going head to head, I find that very interesting. So um, really curious about the story of Kiara and what happens both with her trying to keep her family um, above water and also with the scandal in the police department. So what's gonna happen there and how will she be, um, how will she be treated? How will this resolve? So, all right, that is night crawling. Let's uh, look at what our judge had to say. So our judge did not do an intro at all. She simply jumped in and that's fine. That's what we will do too. She did provide some visual aids this time. So that was interesting. Um, she says, if I were to graph my absorption in the rabbit hutch over time, it might look something like this. And she has absorption and time and it stays pretty high at the absorption level. Just, you know, slight variations over time highly absorbed in the rabbit hutch the whole time. So I don't think if I hold up my iPad, I don't think you're going to be able to see the visual. So I'm sort of drawing it with my hand for you. She has a high level of absorption the entire time she's reading the book. Then she said, and it's drawn on notebook paper. It's, it's a scribble basically. <laughs> and she says, before I explain my very scientific graph, I want to commend the book because I kept thinking the graph was about to nosedive and it never did. The main character, Blandine Watkins, is an ethereally beautiful, precocious genius who at 18 is obsessed with female mystics, climate justice, and fighting evil developers in her hometown of Vacaville, Indiana, a fictional place that in the novel tops Newsweek's list of dying American cities. That's a setup that feels dangerously close to Twee. Also, the language had a mannered or stylized quality, a dull financial angst pounds around her kidneys. I worried its shine would wear off. For me, present tense narration can make a book feel oddly trapped, but Gunty's caught in headlight surrealism ended up serving the story. Her characters too are deformed painfully by their circumstances, institutions, and country. The novel's distortedness ended up suggesting a sort of holiness, like an El Greco painting. Then she says, the book opens with Blandine exiting her body on the floor of her apartment. She has spent most of her life wishing for this to happen. She lives with three boys who, like her, have just aged out of the foster system, and Gunty implies rape or murder. The novel then skips backward to introduce other tenants in their crumbling building, the rabbit hutch of the title, where the walls are so thin you can hear everyone's lives progress like radio plays. These characters are funny and sad and alive. Joan moderates comments for an obituary website. Hope, a new mother, has developed a phobia of her baby's eyes. An aging starlet meets death at a pet shop where the fish remind her of America, busy and doomed and theistic. Good stuff. In one of the longest sections, Gunty conjures Blandine's backstory, how a predatory teacher destroyed her academic promise. The guilt-ridden nice guy who yearns to be mothered by a high schooler is a familiar character, but Mr. Yeager is perceptively drawn and troublingly sympathetic. And Blandine, wading through a complex snarl of loneliness and lust, proves that she's more than a manic pixie dream girl. So then she writes another section and she calls it bonus points. Plus one, the witty observations about trying to be polite in a laundromat. The fact that a coffee shop selections of avant-garde pies includes charcoal banana and broccoli peach plus two points, the formal experimentation, including a chapter told entirely in black marker drawings, plus three, the sense in a book whose characters constantly wonder whether they're awake or dreaming of violence and self-violence as the last recourse of people who feel unreal. I really love the way she has described the book, how she covered all of the characters that were really important and the highlights of the book. Um, 
without really giving anything away. So I really like what she wrote here. I think she really gets this book and really did a good job explaining it and reviewing it. So let's see what she has to say about Nightcrawling. She says, Nightcrawling by Layla Motley has an intensely single focus. Told in first-person present tense, it follows one protagonist, Kiara, who is hunting for work to support herself, her brother Marcus, and an abandoned nine-year-old named Trevor. Kiara walks the streets of East Oakland, where she is preyed upon by police officers. The novel is based on a 2015 news story about a ring of cops who exploited at-risk teenagers for sex. Motley's prose has an urgent, intimate, I am speaking into your ear quality. My graph for night crawling looks like this. And then she starts her graph with absorption versus time. Starts it in about the middle and it just goes way up. So it goes whoop. Um, so different from the graph for um, the rabbit hutch, which stayed high. This one starts middling and goes up. So there you have it with the two graphs. Again, on notebook paper, a bit of a scribble. Here's what else she says. This is a book that pulls you deeper and deeper into one character's brain and body. The better you know Kiara, the more you get a sense of her life, the richer the story feels. It's a cumulative experience. The Rabbit Hutch, by contrast, is spinning multiple plates in the air from the jump. Nightcrawling is about growing up too soon and who gets to be a child. It's also about children themselves, their weird logic, solemn infatuations, and kooky etiquette. Yanked into an adulthood of impossible choices, Kiara is trying to preserve the kid-like parts of Trevor, such as his enthusiasm for basketball and dance parties. Meanwhile, the grown-ups in her life, including her mom and brother, continually fail her. Marcus, who dreams of making it in the music industry, refuses to get a paying job. Kiara's mother lives in a halfway house and can't come to terms with her responsibility for the death of Kiara's baby sister. There's a lot of bleakness here, but Motley's empathy, the book loves its characters, you can feel it pulling for them, helps counteract it. The least transient parts of Kiara's life are her relationships and the fortification she draws from friends and chosen family is genuinely moving. The writing itself reflects Motley's tenure as the 2018 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate, supple and intelligent, vulnerability threaded with steel. Ain't this everything they said it would be, Kiara thinks as a cop assaults her, and ain't I so sad to be familiar. Ain't this just another night? So many ways to walk a street, and I'm still just a girl with skin. I had a few quibbles, several fist-pumping moments in which Kiara confronts various relatives felt unrealistic or hokey, a hastily sketched romance that seems to patch her world together in the last act isn't quite earned. Mostly, the book made me think about the uses and pitfalls of creating an easy-to-interpret narrative that describes a hard-to-solve problem. As Motley writes in her author's note, Nightcrawling is written against a racist conception of Black womanhood and toward a truer or more representative vision. Truth value is just that, valuable, but I found myself looking for what made the novel specific or inventive or surprising enough to transcend Motley's stated political objective. For me, that answer lay in Kiara's voice, which marries fierce open-heartedness to old soul irony. And then she goes back to bonus points. She says, plus one, the image of a swimming pool filled with dog shit, the image of a single giant birthday pancake. Plus two, the eroticism of Kiara watching a girl skateboard, trying to make my gaze so concrete and powerful that Ale would know I saw her more than her girlfriend ever could. And plus three points, the fact that Layla Motley wrote Nightcrawling when she was 19. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so that's what she had to say about Nightcrawling. I mean, this is the toughest one, uh, the toughest judging that I've seen so far. Um, both books really good. And of course, as we get farther and farther in the tournament, it's going to get harder and harder. But I think that... Um, she definitely, that Katie Walden definitely had it harder than any other judge. And she just does an amazing job um, explaining the two books, giving the pros and cons, um, really highlighting what's beautiful about both books and telling, you know, what her um, concerns were. So let's look at the judgment and see who she chooses. It's actually a bit longer judgment than um, we've experienced with any of the others, but I think that's warranted. So here's what she says. Wasn't there some philosopher who defined beauty as the most complexity contained in the simplest possible expression? 
I tried to Google it and found Hume, each mind perceives a different beauty, which is not helpful for a would-be judge. My mind perceives the one correct beauty. But a lot of this decision did, in the end, come down to complexity. I guess I never grew out of loving the shiny thing, the thing that whistles and beeps and plays music while it tries to brush your teeth. Which is to say, if two books pack a comparable emotional wallop, I reliably go for the one that's more intricate, experimental, and unusual. Here's a more specific, retrospective breakdown of my criteria. Was I moved? I honestly think I was moved basically equally by The Rabbit Hutch and Nightcrawling. Did I cry? Neither of these books made me cry. A number of book, movie, music reviewers like to describe how they cried while consuming a book, movie, or piece of music. To them, I say, congratulations on your sensitivity in robotic monotone. I guess that should be congratulations on your sensitivity in robotic monotone. I did not cry. Structural complexity. The rabbit hutch has the clear edge here. Nightcrawling plots one arc. The rabbit hutch plots at least five arcs and then twines them together. Linguistic complexity. On a sentence level, the advantage goes to nightcrawling. Motley sticks close to Kiara's thoughts, so when something dramatic happens, the prose speeds up and starts to unravel. There are ambitious, involved metaphors, a few of which pull you out of the action because they're hard to track. Meeting this criteria can backfire. Line by line, Gunty's voice is sparser. Moral complexity. Look, I love a light, dark binary in literature. The Marsh versus the Mead Hall, Goodman Brown versus the Devil, Elves versus Orcs. But if you're not writing allegory or epic, I'm going to need some nuance. The Rabbit Hutch follows characters whose mixed motivations and strange behavior make them both mysterious and dynamic. There's compassion, curiosity, and a commitment to observation rather than judgment. Kiara's life, by contrast, has descriptive texture, but not moral texture. We get pungent details about her experience, but she is always a woman in a difficult situation trying to do the right thing. The cops who explored her, exploit her are muscles, badges, a gun held to her face. Compare the slimy teacher from the rabbit hutch who is always legible as a person, even an occasionally well-intentioned person, albeit one whose self-delusions paper over the gap between those intimate, intermittent kind impulses and his grotesque behavior. Nightcrawling isn't supposed to be morally complex. You might protest and you are correct. That's exactly the problem. And so she also <laughs> follows the uh, review with a series of triangles and formulas and it makes it look like she was counting things with tick marks. Um, again, if I show you, I don't know that you'll be able to see it. Oh, maybe you can. Well, a little bit. It reflects my, uh, my ring light. But she does a lot of formulas there saying that she worked really hard on choosing the winner. But she has chosen the rabbit hutch basically because um, it is less straightforward, handles the five different arcs well, um, and comes out still with a cohesive story that has a message. Um, I really think she had a difficult job here, that these are both really good books. Um, they both sound incredible, um, and I can't wait to read Nightcrawling in addition to The Rabbit Hutch. So I hope that you appreciate the work that Katie Walden did for us here. Rabbit Hutch is going forward. That is the end of round two. That is the fourth match in round two and the last one. So Monday, we will be looking at round three and we will have four books comp uh, competing against one another in the semifinal. We'll have two and two. And then on the 31st, we will have the two final books going head to head who to see who wins the tournament of books. I really hope you've enjoyed this today. I think these were two great books and I loved talking about them with you. Um, as I said, I'll be back Monday with more Tournament of Books. Over the weekend, I have four new books for you that I want to introduce to you and one book review. So I'm excited about that as well. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please smash the like and subscribe button. That benefits me a great deal and allows me to keep coming back with more videos. I do also, as I mentioned, have um, a gift list, a wish list at the bottom of my video descriptions. If you're ever inclined to gift a book to me so that I can read it, uh, do a review on the channel and give you a shout out, I would love that. But of course, you're under no obligation to do that. 
Um, I can't wait to come back with more books to talk to you about. I enjoy doing this each and every day, and I will see you soon. Take care.